There's something about Africa that, when it's got hold of you, it just doesn't want to let you go. It's a mysterious place, full of magic. And I guess I'm still trying to figure out the puzzle. When I was a child, I had a jigsaw. It was a map of Africa, and I was fascinated by it, trying to imagine those exotic places like Timbuktu and Dar es Salaam. Of course, my mum was brought up in East Africa, and she was always telling us stories of her own childhood. And so I guess that's where my fascination started. Well, for me as a child living in Cheltenham, it was wonderful trying to imagine the wildlife in Africa, the sea that my mum so loved, and of course the jungle that she was always talking about. After he'd recovered, it was a question of where to go next. And though there were several opportunities, Africa came up, East Africa. And whilst he was a bit of a hypochondriac and hated the thought of the wild animals, the creepy crawlies, the diseases, my mother, who was incredibly strong, said, don't be ridiculous, let's go to Africa. <laughs> So, in August 1936, at only three, my mother, with her family, set sail for Africa. Grandpa's first posting was in Dar es Salaam, but it wasn't long before he was moved to Iringa. It was unusual because uh, we moved from place to place. My father would never leave us at school in England, for instance. So we were picked up and moved all the time. But Iringa was one of the places that I loved so much and where we had the wonderful Helga, our governess. She had a dog who had puppies and we used to dress the poor little puppies up in our doll's clothes and wheel them around the garden in our doll's prams. And so life went on in a very pleasurable way. Because I was born in the Middle East and brought up in the Middle East and Africa, you take the natives of the country for granted and it was the colonial days and the natives were our servants but we loved them i mean my parents were so good to all the african servants and we had such respect and love in return i remember once i had a little gold medallion that had been given to me when i was confirmed and I lost it, couldn't find it anywhere. And I shall never forget, our houseboy found it and came running to me with this tiny little gold medallion. And that was the relationship we had with our servants. And 
so we set sail, and on the 3rd of September, 1939, arrived in Suez. And later in the evening, the captain announced over the loudspeaker that war had been declared on Germany, and therefore we would not be able to move until a convoy had been formed at Port Side to take us safely home to England. Grandpa's leave was soon over, and much against the wishes of his family, he decided that during the war, his wife and children would be better off out of England. So in the spring of 1940, we set sail once again in convoy for Africa. As a child, I tried to imagine what it was like in Africa. And one of my favourite stories was the train journey my mum used to take to school. We had to take this long, long train journey. My little friend and I used to sit on the steps of the train, singing our hearts out. We used to imagine peering out at us. Maybe a lion, maybe a leopard. But at every station, all the little African children would be there waving with their lovely brown, smiling faces. It was just absolute bliss. In 1942, Daddy was posted to Aden, and as usual, he took us all with him but he very quickly realised that the day convent in Aden would not be suitable for his growing daughters. So we were sent back to Kenya, and we didn't realise when we said goodbye to our parents that it would be two years before we saw them again. The school in Nairobi was lovely, and we had acres of ground for playing fields and lovely tennis courts. I wasn't an academic. I was never really interested in lessons as such. I uh, was far happier daydreaming, looking out of the window, watching the birds. When you reach the age of 13, you had to go into a retreat three days. I don't think any of us kept quiet for three days. And there were lovely coffee plantations all round the boundaries. And we used to have to walk through these coffee plantations with our rosaries. When the coffee bean is at a certain stage, it's actually quite sweet, quite delicious. So it would be one Our Father, one coffee bean, one Hail Mary, another coffee bean. And it helped us get through this tedious walk. Very, very. If they speak, you know they come from you. Staying with a family in Africa, one of the best times of day is first thing with the sounds of the early morning, cooking, chickens, children. Don't forget, in colonial times, we were kept very much to the British or European community rather than mixing with the Africans and when we did as I say like going to join them for their meal we did it really not letting our parents know though I expect they suspected In 1949, Daddy was posted to North Africa, and we left the shores of East Africa 
never to return. From North Africa, we then came home to England, and I realized then how little I knew of the country where I had spent so much of my youth, and what a great omission it was that we hadn't learnt at school where Africa fitted into the colonial system and the whole aspect of how we came to be there. I realized when I tried to mix with the other English girls of similar age, I didn't fit in. And it was a question of what am I going to do next? My dear people. <laughs> it is difficult. Go on, Mark, go.